How close do you think are we to the precipice then? How close are we to the edge? I'm not positive we haven't already started falling off. But uh, as I said, so much is possible right now. We could sprout wings, right? So... Zev, welcome to the show. Thanks, Joe. It's it's great to be here. I, I certainly turn to your podcast when I want to learn about the world. So this is a wonderful opportunity. Man, that's that's very kind. And um, I think that a great place to start would be with some real, I suppose, low hanging fruit because uh, you know I can imagine that you know from your appearance, you know people will recognize you are the son of Eric Weinstein. Mm-hmm. Uh, your uncle Brett Weinstein has been on our podcast twice. Um, I believe he's been he's been on the show twice. So I'm really interested in trying to deconstruct how a family produces a population of such brilliant thinkers. So I was wondering, do you have any thoughts on how your family has managed to produce such deep thinkers, such real quality thinkers in such a small population? Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Firstly, family is a specialization of community. Like we get different communities of different sizes uh, and each with their own culture and unique qualities. Family is sort of the smallest unit of, of culture and community that can exist uh, and sort of sustain itself in its own ecosystem. And it's a peculiar sort of community to, to look at because usually when we have particular ideologies that we try to implement over uh, a huge community, they break down with incentive structures where not everyone has each other's best interests at heart. You know, this is like, if you think about kibbutzim in, in Israel and why whatever sort of worked, worked, it, it has to do with the fact that um, Families are communities where incentive structures are, are very aligned and no one really tries to screw each other, uh, each other over. So I think one component that I would say uh, has been very important in my family's culture has really been the, the Jewish tradition. And I think that's great because it also extends to a greater community, which is harder uh, with you know 20 million people it's harder to implement the same sort of idealism but it, it comes close i think the jewish culture and jewish values uh have been special and unique and sort of productive for a long time because before you know ancient greece we had this talmudic tradition which was sort of this like pseudo socratic tradition. And I think that in many ways, that has been the culture of my family. It has been a family that's very centered around questions and dialectic. And I think that that has given me an opportunity to, to love truth and the search of truth. So I'm very thankful that uh, I, I could be born into that. But I also think that it doesn't require a family which believes in a certain sort of culture to discover on one's own what culture might be conducive to uh, a stronger world, a stronger global community. Um, I think it's sort of this, this passion for finding truth which has characterized my family. And that, that's one of the things that I'm most proud of about us. Man, that was a really, really thoughtful answer. I would love to pick up on perhaps the cultural um, aspect which you mentioned. So in regards to, say, your family and other families, you know, you mentioned uh, dialectics. Um, You mentioned being centered around questions. What are some other things which have really been encouraged in your childhood, which have helped to perhaps develop you cognitively? It's an interesting question, and you know maybe it's a question to which I'm not really supposed to know the answer because a lot of a lot of parenting is about pretending that you know what you're doing when, when, <laughs> when you know, 
that's something that I, I may look forward to about the future. But um, I think that humor has been very encouraged as the connection between members of my family, where there's a lot of room for difference uh, in serious topics. But if we think about uh, humor, its greatest function to some extent is as a means of, of showing that we come from the same place, we appreciate the, the same jokes. Um, and I think about like jokes in my, in my family, which maybe wouldn't be funny elsewhere, but I think that humor in some sense is a defense against assimilation. And weirdly, it's one of the healthiest ways that you can preserve a culture without becoming exclusive. And I think my family has been uh, similar in its mannerisms and its way of being for a long time, probably for a few generations, partially because it's been the same sense of humor and the same jokes. I wonder if this is the same within other families, but once again, we can generalize that to communities. Does it make sense to have jokes which belong to a community that wouldn't be funny elsewhere so that uh, humor is a means of preserving culture when that culture has something to offer and is a, is a grounds for, for belonging. So I hadn't really thought about this before and th this is perhaps what makes it such a good question. It's probably worth thinking about what works in our families and could that be applied to greater communities without the change in incentive structures degrading whatever allows that family to work and preserve itself uh, as an independent unit. So a really interesting question. It's something that, that I'll have to think about in terms of how to generalize what works in my family. I love it, man. I love it. I just want to pull this thread just perhaps say one more time. And I wonder, um, you know, because I'm really, in, I'm really interested in deconstructing world-class thinkers. This is what I really enjoy doing. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the environment that they're raised in, that they grow up in, the conditions that allow someone to flourish uh, and to really make sense of the world. Um, so I was wondering, do you have any perhaps stories from, uh, could be interactions with family or just for, just stories from perhaps when you've grown up that you've thought to yourself, you know, this is not typical perhaps of say a common childhood you know, a sort of um, an instance or a sequence of things where you thought to yourself, you know, this, this is part of the formula that allows me to think so deeply. Uh, because obviously, I mean, you, you're clearly an outlier from my experience. I mean, you're, you're, you're a very, very intelligent guy. So I'd love to know if you have any thoughts. Sure. Very unusual thing that my dad did once. I think there was a scene in The Sopranos where... Um, I think that was a show that my, my dad used to watch where the Tony Soprano and Carmela are uh, talking amongst themselves, between themselves, and they're, they're saying that they, they hope their daughter doesn't realize how powerless they truly are or how, how clueless they really are. Um, and that's sort of the great secret uh, that characterizes the dynamic between a parent and a child, typically. And I remember my dad showed me that scene because his, uh, his point to me was essentially that if I were to succeed in, in his notion of what it meant to be great, to be a, a thinker, that would mean not succeeding with the world pulled over my eyes. That would mean understanding the chaos, the complexity that exists in every person and seeing people as people instead of roles, which are, you know, we hold different offices in our minds for different uh, relationships, different uh, dynamics. And I think he sort of wanted to shatter the illusion for me. And he wanted me to view people as people and not whatever their roles were supposed to be in my, 
in my mind. And I think that's allowed me to think more deeply about social fabrics. So I think that it was an unusual way of trying to be very proactive in breaking my illusions, because in some sense, growing up is the destruction of illusions which make life more easy. And I think I was never really raised with a strong desire to preserve those illusions for as long as possible. So that was good. I'm, I'm really, happy. I'm really glad I pulled that thread, man. That was a, a beautiful answer. Um, I figured, you know, since we we're on the topic of um, parenting, your YouTube channel is named Generation Z. I know you spend a lot of time thinking about your generation. Um, just on this podcast, we've had several scholars on you. Like we had um, Greg Lukianov, who authored The Codlin of the American Mind mm -hmm. with uh, Jonathan Haidt. He talked about how perhaps, despite we these good intentions which people have, perhaps as a society, maybe we are coddling young minds. So I would love to get your thoughts on Generation Z. Um, and I wonder, could you tell our audience about Generation Z and perhaps what challenges they will face going forward? Sure. So there are a few things which make my generation very weird and very important. And it's got a lot going for it. And the world collapsing is part of its formative experience. So... <laughs> Firstly, if we look at the, the COVID pandemic, in our previous framework, uh, where we established that youth is predicated, uh, or the, our usual paradigms around youth are predicated on an assumption that those around us are wiser, they have all of the lived experience, which we have yet to accumulate, and in order to become those those wise people and see all that they have seen, uh, we have to dive into our lives and amass experience. The weird thing about the, the COVID pandemic is that not only has no one my age experienced anything similar to it, no one from any older generation has seen anything uh, of the like either. And so that particular feature that has changed in the past year is interesting because it means that our illusions of youth as a waiting period to experience all that has been experienced by those around us, that illusion has been broken. And there's a question about, will my generation find life sort of meaningless if they don't believe in this illusion that uh, there is a world of experiences which make wiser people's lives richer. Like if they don't believe that uh, there is some great wisdom which only the, the elders of, of our society have experienced, will that make life worth living for us? And that's, that's an odd question. There are a lot of things that's wrong with the, with the world where I feel like conversations in general are less rich because uh, complexity is danger. And there's a question about, will we, uh, will we persevere through that? And then the other thing, which perhaps give my, gives my generation a very unusual potential, which I don't think has been uh, seen before, is if we look at this equation, which is probably been around since the collapse of feudalism and the beginning of the industrial revolution where uh, motivation plus capability somehow equals success. Like that is, that's sort of the, the fundamental equation of capitalism in previous, uh, throughout previous centuries, we would say that that was like the physics term. We would say that's a very inelastic equation. A lot of energy is lost in sort of random and unpredictable ways you can understand being very motivated and very capable, but maybe you can't get into a great school and that's an external feature, or you don't have enough money to afford the education you'd like. There is so much information that exists freely that really that equation has become very elastic because anyone who desires, like, honestly, I think if I desired a, a med school 
education. That's not what I'm looking for. But there would be enough information online to know everything that a doctor knows. And there's a question about will my generation have the motivation to dive into that? So we have all the resources at our disposal. This uh, framework where capitalism exists that takes uh, motivation and capability as the only components uh, determining success, that's become much more achievable. And yet we're still seeing everything fall apart. And there's a question about will my generation pull together uh, or will we be destroyed by the collapse of what is likely an equality cycle? So. I'd be really interested to pick up on a few things you said there. So one of the things in which I'm really interested about, which I had never thought of before you mentioned, was obviously I mentioned that perhaps uh, a criticism perhaps of your generation that perhaps Haidt and Luki and I have talked about is perhaps that young minds have been coddled. Whereas if you think about, say, the COVID pandemic, then, you know, it's not like the Navy SEALs where if things get tough, then you can ring the bell in hell. We can, you can just end the pandemic and go about your lives. And to me, the COVID pandemic is a real time to ponder um, existential threat. It was a time to ponder what it really means to be human, to be alive. How do you think that your generation will fare now that they have experienced COVID? Will it be a blessing for them? Will it be, um, will it hinder them? How, how do you think that will sort of unfold in the future? Well, the great thing about it is that it was global. And I know that's a weird thing to say. <laughs> I know a lot of people were very negatively affected, but weirdly, we were sort of negatively affected equally. Um, we all went through this together. We all lost people. We all had that same um, experience for the most part. And I know that there were, there have been studies done to say that the place where you're, you're sheltering, uh, and quarantining has a lot to do with your mental health during the, the period. And I'm not discounting those differences, but to a very significant extent, this is something, uh, through which we have all lived together. And there's a possibility that that will degrade the superficial differences which we perceive between us. I have a lot of hope for that because I feel like before this pandemic, it was like, I don't know what some unusual character might have been doing at the same time that I knew what I was doing, but now I'm at home and they're at home. And <laughs> it's, it's a great equalizer. So maybe that will be a good thing. There, there's hope. What was the biggest lesson you learned in 2020? That's, a, that's an interesting question. I feel like I've taken a lot of time to myself to learn about very technical things, which I, uh, I, I hope will play a great role in my future. It's hard to think about what... Uh, a, a grand lesson would be. I suppose that I've always thought a lot about self-teaching. That's something that's mattered excessively to me. And given the time for which COVID has allowed in our personal lives, I think I was really uh, able to make the most of that. I've been, I sort of took this, this weird approach to my education. Brian Keating, uh, who you've had on your show, it was a, it was a great episode. Um, I, I started, I started working for him trying to, to learn physics so I could be of as much use as possible. And, um, I tried to think about like, what would be the easiest way to learn or the, the fastest way to learn all of physics and <laughs> all the <of> physics, <laughs> right. Um, and he was, uh, he was helpful in giving me resources, but the other thing that I tried was I, I found, uh, I started thinking about the, the GRE subject test in physics, which is supposed to evaluate you after uh, an undergraduate education in the, in the field. And I, I realized whatever information they're testing on that test will probably be equivalent to the information which you are expected to learn 
and remember and be comfortable with during four years of college education. And like all of that material exists online. Uh, and as if I have that directory, which is that test, there should be nothing which keeps me from learning all of it. So I got a book on the physics GRE, which pointed me to all of the material. And I've really been trying to explore how elastic this connection is between uh, motivation and comprehension and being able to really understand something at the level that uh, maybe a, a physicist would. And I'm, I'm certainly, uh, I certainly have, a, have a, a ways left to go, but it's proved to me how democratized uh, the ability to be a, a technical or functioning uh, member of society has become, because really it was all there. It's like, it was one hack that I thought of and I've learned so much in the process of trying to employ that, that hack. And it's, it's given me confidence that there is an infinite amount that can be achieved now because the gatekeepers for powerful resources have been removed largely. So I think if my generation hacks self-teaching, there's an infinite amount we can accomplish. And I think having the time to explore that route has been uh, one of the most useful ways I could have learned that lesson. So it's given me hope. I love this concept of self-teaching. And on the show, I've long been an advocate that people uh, only take up uh, a university education when it's absolutely necessary. I believe that your uncle Brett, I mean, when he was on the show, he described, you know, a modern university education as a racket, you know, and, and my um, opinion on this is that in some instances it's absolutely necessary, but uh, you know, I sort of spoke out against people sort of getting there via like a factory set in way, you know, by just going there for the sort of, no, uh, to, to pass the time to spend three or four years there. So I'd be really interested to, to kind of double click on self-teaching. You know, I mean, what is that? Obviously, you mentioned that there is um, a real litany of resources out there now. I mean, you could learn to program, you can learn physics. What does it look like to actually self-teach? What does this look like mechanically? Are you dedicating hours of the day to it? How, how are you learning this new stuff? Well, theoretically, uh, if all of the information that needs to be learned is available to me and I am capable of understanding it, there should be nothing that holds me back. And obviously time is a very limiting resource, which has fortunately become more abundant lately. But I, I bought this book on conquering the physics GRE, and it said, this is, this is everything you need to know uh, for the test. And it, it walked me through some stuff. And for some stuff, it expected that I understood things which I didn't yet understand. And I've, I've used the internet and I've bought books and I've tried to, to learn about those things just so I speak the language of physics enough to understand what the book is assuming will be a review of the subject, but for me, it's actually my, like my introduction, which is weird. Um, but it is a weird, it is a weird concept that essentially for the price of a book, I have the key to uh, what a physicist sees. Uh, and I haven't gotten all the way there yet, but like I'm, I'm holding this key and I, I, I can't believe it's, it's in my hand because I never would have imagined that it could be that easy, right? So I almost can't believe that we're here where no one, like, no one tells you that that much is at your disposal because there is a system which is expected to uh, eat all of us and spit us out in some changed uh, way, maybe for the better, maybe for the, uh, the benefit of the system. But I think that system used to be necessary and it really isn't anymore.
I think you have to have some experience with it, or at least you have to have some experience with rigor that could be translated into something which the with it, which a system uses, because that sort of ensures that all the good work that, that gets done is then put out into the world. But anyone, anyone can, can have a, a key to whatever they, they'd like to be essentially for the price of a couple books or, or something like that. And that's really new. And I wonder what my generation will do with its neuroplasticity because it, there could be an, an infinite amount Right, and so that's a very exciting concept, and I, I hope we we realize it. Absolutely, I mean it's just crazy to think that, say, for as you mentioned, for the price of a book, you could learn about pretty much any topic in depth. I mean, for me, that is a, a frightening opportunity, and you know, with in a meritocracy, there are going to be people which capitalize on that opportunity, and there will be people you know, that are left behind. So I hope that people, as you say, are heeding the warning and are taking advantage of that because for your generation now, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's a crazy opportunity, right? It's, it's, this is the chance of a lifetime to get ahead. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, the other way that people can get ahead is they, they can steal. And there's a question about which will be, which will be easier. Certainly it's almost, it's almost free for my generation to put in the hard work and hopefully get something out of it. But would it be cheaper or would it be easier to start a revolution and focus less on the hard work, which is now at, at our, like we have the opportunity to put in the hard work, which was not an opportunity that existed previously. I wonder if that will be the choice that we make. You know, I, I mentioned the, the idea of inequality cycles. So really how I, I think about that is particularly with some system like, you know, our, our free market capitalism or even a system where, uh, you know, like an, an older system where, an aristocracy controls uh, the wealth of a country. Uh, as soon as, well, after resources start to be distributed unequally and there starts to be some unfair pattern in how resources are distributed, once once we, we live through enough of that, we eventually see a revolution where usually things get violently redistributed uh, very quickly. And then some new system for allocating real wealth forms from those ruins. And then usually that system breaks as well. And I think that preventing these very violent cycles from taking place every few hundred years should now be as easy as uh, making the allocation of resources fair. Because I think we've, we've studied economics for long enough. We've had uh, enough time since the scientific uh, enlightenment to learn uh, how, to, how to discover. Uh, I think we're in a position now to prevent these violent uh, redistributive cycles. And I think we are, we are looking at the last moment in a cycle before it is reborn. Like if we, if we look at rent seeking, I'm not sure that a, a lot of the people that uh, have so as much as they do now are people that deserve that. There's a question about, can we make the system fair instead of destroying the system? And there are so many tools at our disposal and sometimes it's just more fun for people to set everything on fire. So I don't know what we'll do, but it could go either way. And that is, if I could, if I could uh, ask an Oracle, one thing of importance, it, it might be about this because that's really sort of a, a, a dichotomous 
set of options for our future that should determine everything. And it all may break. How close do you think are we to the precipice then? How close are we to the edge? I'm not positive we haven't already started falling off. But uh, as I said, so much is possible right now. We could sprout wings, right? So I would be curious to see how quickly Generation Z can get its its act together and learn everything and do everything. Like if 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 everything that is known about medicine is now available democratically, would it have been possible for anyone without any connection to academia or to medicine to learn everything and invent uh, or theorize some you know cure to COVID? Yeah, that would have been possible. Like really anything. Uh, that is theoretically possible has become easy. And somehow no one is confident enough in the future to try because it doesn't look like it, it's worth fighting for the future to many of us. It looks like it is worth fighting for, for what's now. And I think the most important thing for people to remember is that a future is really possible, but it takes fighting for it instead of fighting for what exists already and it's risky, but it is the only way that anyone could have anything in the future. Absolutely. And I think that some things which are, are forgotten is that civilizations, they typically don't last. They, they usually, the collapsing is the norm with civilization, that entropy happens. I would be really interested to get your thoughts on um, a few things, this sort of precipice, which we talked about that we may be on, and perhaps linking this to generation z so from my point of view right now i see that there is a lot of division in the world there's um a lot of frustration you know we had say the capital riots recently uh we had protests last year covid came and that that was an existential threat um and for me, when COVID struck, I, I really thought that that was a chance to unite. I thought it was a, a real open goal to come together. Uh, but instead, it seemed to push us even further apart. I would love to know, how do you think the Generation Z will navigate this perhaps culture clash? Do you think the Generation Z can unite or do you think that it could go the other way? How do you think that will unfold? I think ultimately it really depends on how we view science. I think there, if there is a way to move beyond our divisions, that way could be theorized and that takes pursuit of truth and the pursuit of truth takes rigor. There's a question about uh, how how rigorous our generation will be in its approach to uh, reinstalling order. I think that people have things they shouldn't have. Uh, there are too many billionaires who have money that they shouldn't have. And that's why we're looking at all of this very radical stuff where we know that somehow things have to become fair and a lot of violence can be done to a civilization, which is, I think, what you were talking about. A lot of violence can be done in the name of making things fair. And it will take a lot of hard work. It won't just take activism. It will take hard work to discover and ascertain the method of least conflict to bring the world back to some livable state. And I think we need more real politicians. Uh, th those aren't people who, who fight for, for slogans, which already exist. Those are, are people who think about how to do the least damage and violence in restoring uh, whatever it is worth saving. And I think, I think, we, I, I think we have enough at our disposal to, to pull it off. It's a question about motivation and whether the future looks so broken that it's worth fighting for. 
really interesting. I think back to the conversations that we had with Brett and one thing we asked, asked Brett was how do we heal a broken society? And also, is it possible? Do you think that it is possible to heal a broken society? Absolutely. As I said, I could imagine us sprouting wings and, and <laughs> flying away from this disaster because all of the natural limitations have weirdly been removed partly and due to partly due to the internet and how easy it is to learn everything and learn how to do everything. Uh, there are so many more people with the power to bring about the future that it's weird that we are not seeing the future. Uh, like we're, we're watching everything collapse when we should be watching everything grow at some tremendous rate there yeah. i i don't know what to make of that to be entirely honest it, it looks like we're having the opposite uh period in society uh to what we should be experiencing absolutely absolutely i'd love to perhaps switch gears and one thing which i know you've thought a lot about is modern tech and particularly how it is changing the world and also how it's going to change the world. What are your thoughts on modern technology and the impact that it is going to have down the line? Well, I wish there were more modern technology. It seems like the areas of growth uh, where change has become very obvious, like, you know, we have phones now, we have laptops now, and I'm not really sure what else, but, I think it's possible that our technology is ruining our attention spans. I think if we're considering social media uh, to be uh, modern technology, then I think it's ruining our ability to think complex uh, in, a, in a complex fashion in some sufficient way to uh, really make the world better. So... I think we should fight for more technology, but the technology we have now is very dangerous and brings great opportunity. In regards to, because um, uh, I guess like a theme which we've been kind of discussing today is the sort of um, challenges, the sort of pitfalls that younger generations coming up will face, obviously social media, is something and, and the digital age is something which people are going to have to navigate. Uh, there's, there's no way around that. I, I would also love to perhaps get your thoughts on media because just throughout my lifetime, I mean, I'm 25 now, I've noticed that since I was growing up that the media has now changed a lot. I find traditional media to be very uh, partisan. I find that there's a lot of division within media. What do you think about the current media setup and where perhaps do you think that that will go in the future? I think that media now understands that we've become less smart. So perhaps one of the reasons that it seems to many of us that our conversations are, are, less, are less nuanced now Perhaps one reason for this is that there is a modern contention that if someone disagrees with us about something that is very fundamental to our uh, belief set, that person must be unethical, they can't be a, a decent human being. And what that does is it ensures that for a person to be connected to those around him, he must put aside uh, anything which is room for uh, ideological uh, misalignment with others because there, there's no way to belong in that case. And that forces everyone to assume much more simple positions and positions where everyone tends to congregate. And so because everyone congregates around very simple uh, positions that it is difficult for those around them to, to take issue with, 
it is so much more easy for media to target very particular belief sets because they don't have to worry about appealing to all belief sets to seem credible. So I'm quite worried about that because it, media's job is easy. And if they, if they do have an agenda, they don't have to put as much effort into obscuring it because it won't seem like an agenda to everyone who speaks the language or says the things that they say. It'll just seem like news. Uh, and I think the best defense against this is for everyone to understand that congregating around simple positions in order to connect to the world makes it easier for everyone to be lied to and for who's ever, whoever is in charge of spinning the stories to win. And maybe concretely, the defense against this is not assuming someone's character so easily from uh, however their beliefs are, are, are not aligned with yours. And it's not even to say that it, it isn't the right thing to make those sorts of decisions about a person's character, but the trade-off should always concern whether making those decisions is uh, worth the harm that you are doing to nuance and to society in order to deny uh, the person in, in question support. Like th that should always be the trade-off which will hedge against uh, how easy it is for a very small group of people to, to lie to uh, a, a huge group of people. I completely agree with literally every word that you said, but there, I would love to pick up on um, nuance because in my own life, when I haven't examined my own thoughts and I've gone for a, a factory set in thought, I've usually paid a price for that sooner or later down the line. Um, I found that on this show, we've sort of confused people a bit because for instance, when we bring people on, we will bring people on from the left and we will mm -hmm. bring on people from the right. And people are kind of confused that we take each individually as there is and sort of stay out of the identity side. And as you say, that nuance is under attack. Why is nuance so rare in this day and age? Probably due to uh, the almost like neo-McCarthyism, which gives people that, that shock that you are willing to talk to people of, of different understandings of the world. I think guilt by association is one of the most powerful weapons for destroying everything we love. So I, I don't really believe in, in deplatforming uh, a person, regardless of what that person has to say. I think if a crazy person addresses the entire world, we should work with the world to be able to reason through why they should not listen to a word of what that person is saying or why they shouldn't take it seriously. We, the fact that we decide instead to deplatform the crazy person is proof to us that um, we don't like, our, we have become so stupid as a whole that society can't be trusted to discern complete craziness from truth and from reason. And if we work on building our ability to reason, to be logical, to be scientific, we won't have to, we won't have to get messy and, and worry about censoring speech because uh, we should have a society that we trust enough to filter their own ideas of what is, what is right. So, it's a wonderful thing that you have enough trust in the people who listen to you and your program to uh, disregard whether they will agree with whoever you bring on and you trust their ability to um, reason and make the most out of everything. And 
I think most people understand that that trust doesn't exist anymore. No one trusts them like that. And so uh, instead they, they have to be spoon fed. And if we love ourselves enough and we trust ourselves enough, I think that's a problem that could be put to rest fairly easily, but it means sort of taking a leap of faith. And I wonder if we will be strong enough uh, to, to do that. Absolutely. And I think that one of the things um, just in regards to this show is that, uh, you know, we, we know that we are not a show for everybody. We don't try to be, you know, we know that say we bring on people from different ends of the political spectrum, then that requires somebody to actively listen and to think through the ideas presented and then decide, do I agree with that? And do I not? And then to come away with that with either a strengthened position or a renewed look at their own beliefs. Um, and I think that one thing just on this show is, you know, I mean, someone said the other day, we're quite enigmatic in the way that they can't, quite put a label on us we're quite in the middle of, of different things what, what do you think about perhaps labels uh you know and, and being labeled and labeling yourself and self-defining do you think that those things are kind of helpful do you have any uh, any thoughts about labels well i think labels once again begin with the assumption that everyone who tries to decode us or a group of people will do so poorly. Uh, and therefore we must instead treat, uh, we must we must collapse a, a complexity uh, of beliefs and opinions into one, one name. And I, I don't think that summary is never useful. I think there's great importance in, in summary. It makes everything more efficient. But I think the, the moment a label starts to become problematic, we have to trust everyone enough and work with everyone enough to uh, trust that they will be able to work backwards and restore that complexity from what a person is actually saying as opposed to a summary of what they're saying given perhaps by uh, something political. Right. So I think summary is important, but it should never be uh, used in place of uh, whatever it is. It is meant to uh, synopsize. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because, you know, you mentioned complexity and I'd love to go back to something you said earlier where you talked about perhaps modern technology shortening our attention spans. Do you think that modern technology has made it harder with these perhaps short retention spans for people in the modern world to deal with complex ideas, complex conversations? Is, is that possible? Is there a link there at all? I do. Uh, to be able to strategize, you have to make decision trees that are layers and layers and layers deep and no and at no time could I imagine that strategy uh, would be more important than right now, but it takes a lot of devotion and concentration and creativity uh, to be able to imagine everything that could go one way or another and make very sophisticated uh, decisions ex ante uh, based on that decision tree. I think one of the reasons there's so little strategy right now is that people don't have the patience uh, to plan out possibility. And I wonder if that will be one of the greatest roadblocks in ensuring that we don't achieve what we should. Um, I am loving this. I'm loving this. I, I would love to kind of talk to you about navigating a career a sort of life path in this sort of modern world this sort of hyper digitalized world that we're in um and one rule that i made for myself a few years back was that i decided that when possible 
I wasn't going to select opportunities based on salary. I was mm-hmm. going to choose opportunities based on whether I could become really good at it and thus perhaps indirectly in the future make uh, a, a decent wage. Oh. But I also decided that we're social animals um, and we are susceptible to the values of you know the people around us. Uh, I've heard someone on the show say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. So one of the decisions that I made was that I, I, as much as I possibly could, and I know that this isn't always possible, but I didn't want to work with assholes. Like I didn't want to work with people that I, I really, really didn't respect. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would love to kind of ask you as a brilliant young thinker, how are you thinking about navigating a life and career path in the modern world? So I touched on this a little bit, but I don't think I really got to how it, 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 I imagine it will, it will play in my future and in my career. I am starting with math and physics at uh, my first convenience, not necessarily because I think that I will live a life in the sciences and go into academia, but because I feel that math and physics are about the most deep and rigorous things a person can do with his time. And I think that sort of comprehension and motivation is fungible. So I want to use the time when I'm young to train my perseverance and my mind and my metal in some fungible way that could be applied to anything I, I, I put my I put my mind to. And right now that's math and physics, but essentially I see that as opening a gate to opportunity by doing one of the, the hardest things that, that I could imagine doing. And this this strategy that I, I'm trying to employ where I I start with a book that should summarize four years of college and work backwards from that. There is not like, there are many GRE subject tests for all different uh, disciplines. And this has given me the confidence that if there is any particular thing that I want to learn, I know where to find all of the information and the directory and the central dogma of the field. And I want to do something that proves my passion and my motivation so that um, I can really do anything when I'm older. Because once again, I don't think it used to be that where one went to college was sort of this proof, this receipt, which indicated that a person was capable I think that where someone goes to college now could indicate um, myriad things about that person's uh, character or life or experience. It could be that they want a crapshoot. It could be that uh, they had very rich parents. I'm interested in doing something more strange uh, that could uh, that could be interpreted in fewer ways, and that is how I would like to begin my career. I also think that's interesting what you said about not wanting to work with assholes, because I completely understand and I understand the ways in which our environment influences us. But it's important also to remember that there are people who can be very dysregulated in their personal lives, and they can still be incredible people because of uh, how they treat the world and what they intend for their net impact to be on the universe and how capable they are of uh, accomplishing it. And I I think that that's something that I have to make my own decisions about, which is, am I willing to spend my life and my time with people who infuriate me if I believe that they're ultimately good people? And what does it mean for them to be good people? You know, like Gandhi was probably a weird character in his personal <laughs> life, and he's still someone for whom I have the utmost respect. 
yeah that that's a really um interesting point and i think that you know for me uh i think that you know some people i guess can also be assholes but it you know if some people can be assholes in the sense that they tell you things that perhaps you don't want to hear and in that sense perhaps they align with the best version of who you would want to be so i guess that my kind of take on that would be um that one thing which i theorized anyway was that i wanted to associate with people that in some indirect way could make me better does Mm -hmm. that make sense i wanted to sort of evolve through relationships completely and i think one of the weird things in my experience has been that the characteristics which I find prevalently in people whom I admire are not necessarily the characteristics which I'm looking to inherit at the moment. So I think there's great value in humility, for example, and that's something that I try to practice uh, in my own life to a particular extent. And weirdly, a lot of the people that provide great inspiration to me, like Richard Feynman was not thought of as a, a humble character. He was sort of thought of as, as a very arrogant guy who more than compensated for his arrogance. I remember reading in Jim Watson's book, uh, The Double Helix, about uh, Linus Pauling, who discovered the structure, the first, he made the first discovery of the structure of a biological macromolecule, which was a, like a huge discovery. And everyone else was sort of more like serious and fussy about it. And he, he knew who he was and he was very performative and very arrogant apparently. Uh, and I still really look up to him because he did amazing work and he is probably responsible for, uh, technology, which saved many, many lives. Um, I don't know exactly how to build my own character when I can't align it entirely with some of the people that I, I think of very, I think very highly of. So it's a weird thing to navigate and I, I hope to do my best. Yeah, it, it is a weird thing to navigate. And it's interesting because I think to myself that there are two skills that have personally taken me to a reasonable level, I would say. And I, I would, I always define myself. I would say I'm just a guy with a reasonable, uh, probably an average IQ. But I, I would say that two things which have really helped me, which you definitely have this one, is that I spent a lot of time thinking about thinking, meta thinking. I spent a lot of time trying to learn about how to learn. And, you know, I think that that really helped me, whether that was in a job or building a podcast or in academia. And the other thing which I, personally, which I love to do is I found that there's tremendous advantage to being willing to look stupid. Like, you know, you're in class and you're not following along, right? And, you, and no one wants to speak, but you say, I oh, actually, I don't know what you're talking about. Or just asking questions when other people are afraid to. And for me, through compounding, I found that that has turned into a, an enormous net positive effect of just being willing to kind of look stupid does does that make sense in any way it makes complete sense and i also i wonder if perhaps what creates the image which we perceive as arrogance in some of these exceptional people is the fact that they're asking of the right questions is perceived by those who don't understand why the questions are crucial. It is perceived by those people sometimes as stupidity, right? Yes. So if a, if, a, if a problem is presented uh, in a problematic fashion at school, uh, I imagine that, uh, you know, I've, I've read some of uh, like Feynman's autobiographies and I've read a little bit, a little bit about what we know about Einstein in school, you know, um, maybe they would ask what seemed like a very basic question uh, about the material that was being provided if it was actually being uh, provided in some way that was technically wrong or wrong at some higher level. And then by asking that question, those people get misinterpreted. And then very often because they feel that they are 
routinely misinterpreted uh, uh, and taken for a, a, an idiot by those around them, it is easy to build a very uh, contentious relationship with people who don't think like you do or uh, people who don't think didn't think like they did. Uh, and maybe you decide that you're you're better than them or that they're all just wrong and you're right. And I think that that's a trap that a lot of smart people or technical people fall into. And it's important to realize that even if something is technically wrong, we all think differently. And I don't want to fall into that trap of thinking that I'm, I'm better than everyone else just because uh, something is technically wrong and I, and I catch it. And then uh, I, I, I don't want to form my arrogance based on that set of problems. And that's difficult, but that's a struggle that I think I'm going to have to go through. 100%. And, and, you know, just from my own point of view, from spending a significant amount of time in academia, I have always found that some of the worst professors that I have had mm -hmm. are the people that they may be very technically minded, but you can sort of see with them that they're kind of lost in an echo chamber. They mm -hmm. kind of missed out on interacting with people outside of their bubble they've sort of become trapped within their own little uh ideological echo chamber and and i find it quite sad to see you know that these people can't interact with the general population you know i i think that it's like a huge missing thing and, and the people which i know that um you know that we've had on the show like for instance andrew huberman he was a wonderful communicator and a wonderful technical thinker. So I think that th there are many, I guess, components that go into building a, a fantastic mind. But I certainly think that, you know, you are on definitely on the right path. Uh, I, I appreciate that. I also, you have to have a weird relationship. I think of myself as, as a very technical person and that comes with whatever mixed bag it, it, it comes with but sometimes you have to you have to have a complicated take on very technical people who don't necessarily seem approachable for example and I think that comes from the fact that as you said uh, a lot of these people are completely lost in their own heads they live in their they live in their own heads but then <laughs> you also so you know there's a way in which you feel bad for that. But then on the other hand, they very often come out at the end and, you know, every few years they, they come out of their own head and give something to the world, which is beautiful and useful. And then they retreat back into their, uh, in, into the only place where uh, they are heard and understood, which is by, by themselves. But because we don't really have a, an, an excellent means of of treating individualism collectively that's probably one of the best things we can do to address whatever problems we're having right now is we know that uh particular individuals uh are can be very unique and very productive and uh do great things we need to figure out how we treat radical individualism we get some of these characters every now and then, you know, we get a Beethoven uh, or an Einstein. And you wonder how many of these people we would have had if we knew how to deal kindly with uh, very individualistic types. I, I love that point. I love that point. I've heard you speak very eloquently about the role that language has in shaping our ideas. Um, perhaps in the sense that language is um, kind of linked to our capacity to think. So I would love to know just sort of what role does language play in our ability to think? It's a great question and one that really defines the human experience. I remember hearing Noam Chomsky say at some point that uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
I'll say that I'm not quoting him exactly because I, I don't want to misconstrue, misconstrue something that he said, but is a, I think his point was essentially that we use language more to think within our own head than we do to communicate with those around us. But language very typically isn't developed inside of one's own head. It's developed collectively uh, by a society, by wars, by you know, people of different uh, ethnicities who, who, who start families together during wartime, like all of these really weird things. It's a very chaotic process by which language is uh, formed and that language determines, the, the strength of that language determines our capacity to be able to think. So weirdly, uh, we don't, Our, our ability to deal with the world theoretically is determined by some very chaotic process. And that's, that's quite weird. And language is both the thing which allows us to play with ideas and which it is also the thing which corrupts abstraction when we try to express it, right? So if, if, every, if every idea that could exist or could be had has some platonic ideal, it is instantiated by the expression of it. And that means that it is corrupted and it becomes less beautiful. And so by thinking and using language, we are destroying the beauty of abstraction and building our own ability to uh, play with it and contend with it. And it's a really, it's a really weird, almost paradoxical thing. Does writing improve our thinking? Is there a link there? So here's the, here's the weird thing about that. As I said, language was developed chaotically, but naturally we have a facility for language. We have evolved to communicate verbally. Not only is writing, not our, our systems of communicating over a page, not only is that sort of a weird almost uh, a, a weird system that's almost been chaotic and it's uh, coming to be, it is not a system with which we have a natural facility. Mm -hmm. So we are not evolved to read, we are not evolved to write. It is completely artificial, whereas uh, our facility with language is innate. And it's that's why it's weird that so much of our ability to grow has been determined by this artificial thing which we created. The printing press was a very important uh, invention for a reason, but uh, the radio uh, and one's ability to actually communicate verbally with an entire population is perhaps a more powerful invention which gets looked looked past because it appeals to our it, it appeals to a much more natural part of our brain instead of something that we've invented. Yeah, is because I'm just trying to think back to say like classical language and like say like the Shakespearean Shakespearean era. How is I'm just trying to sort of conceptualize how language has changed to today. Uh, has our language improved? Has it got worse? I, I'm trying to think about how how that has happened because obviously language changes over time. I'm trying to, th to think about language in the modern era. Well, language has become much more standardized. Um, at least it, it, it has been on a trajectory for a long time of becoming more standardized. And I don't know if we are, uh, like if identity politics, for example, is uh, making language less standardized because uh, we're trying to preserve every individual's uh, ability to communicate uh, in some way which is compatible with them and only them, but really language is about communicating with everyone around you. So that's, it, it's a weird way in which it seems like we're regressing. Language has become more standardized since then. Obviously, new words have been invented, you know, invented, you know there's semantic change, both, I, I think we call it amelioration and deterioration, which is uh, oh, maybe there are four types. There's also specialization and generalization. Those are the four ways that, those are the axes uh, on which words are, are, are said to change. 
But um, not only has, has language become better and more standardized, uh, it is also like we are also less good at it than we were uh, 60 years ago. The average English vocabulary has decreased quite radically. Uh, yeah, and in, in very, you know, in the past 50 years or so, our vocabularies have become smaller. And that's a baffling thing to think about. You'd imagine that we would be getting smarter. But um, it's important to think about the fact that once our vocabulary shrinks, if language is used primarily to communicate with ourselves and develop our own thoughts, then our own thoughts become less complex and less powerful and our ability to think is ruined. So I think how we interact with language and how language uh, has changed tells us a lot about what's going on inside people's minds. It's interesting because I, I just have to pick that up because kind of the cancel culture deplatforming culture war which we're in it seems like words have become weaponized and there are certain words that people are afraid to say people are afraid to say misgender someone mm -hmm. does identity politics and creating a culture where people are afraid to say what they think does that kind of make us stupider in a way, if that makes sense? Because if it impairs our, our way to think? I think in some ways it does. And then in some ways there are trade-offs between different languages. So perhaps one of the reasons that English has become uh, the language which is spoken most prevalently around the world, uh, aside from the, the reach of the British Empire, perhaps the reason that English has become so widespread is that it is the largest language in terms of vocabulary. Uh, and therefore, it has very particular advantages and disadvantages. And it may be that uh, it is, we, we might call this cultural diffusion, uh, mm. has been what it has with English because English is a good language for a lot of things. So I think with smaller languages, much of the beauty that is expressed by that language uh, is due to the, the beauty of particular words in that language. So, um, you know, like in, in Thai, I think there's this word sanuk, which is a, a, a beautiful, the, the meaning of which is, is a very particular, beautiful sense of joy, which is uh, sort of ineffable. You get beautiful words in smaller languages, but um, you don't get many of those words in English because there are so many uh, very technical words with very logical meanings that you are supposed to construct beauty from uh, syntax as opposed to having syntax, which is uh, originally endowed with beauty. And perhaps that is a better system because as I said, language, the, the creation of language can be very chaotic. Um, and here, the, the beauty and the power that can be expressed by language is not up to those chaotic forces. It is at the, um, it is at the hands of an individual. And I think the power of an individual is something that has coincided with culture that surrounds the English language. And there are advantages and disadvantages, but perhaps that is why it is so widespread. Man, I am absolutely loving this. I'm loving this. This is, this is fascinating. Um, I just got a couple more topics I would love to cover with you. Um, you said that philosophy becomes dangerous in difficult times. Could you mm. double click on this for me? Sure. Um, I think people are more at risk for thinking deeply and questioning things which no one wants to uh, question at um, a time when people are, uh, are fighting for 
what already exists instead of fighting for new ideas and uh, asking questions is disruptive and philosophy is centered around asking deep questions and finding deep questions. So I think the people who philosophize are more at risk. And I also think that people are more desperate at uh, during dangerous times or times when the world is on fire or at war. And so perhaps philosophies that aren't particularly well thought out could yield greater consequences because people are just about ready to try anything. Is an example of this quite recently, we saw the Wall Street bets incident where uh, a bunch of, you know, idiot uh, Redditors, <laughs> they came together and, and did Wall Street for billions and billions of dollars. And then straight away, the institutions, they moved straight away to protect their interest and stopped people obviously getting these shares. Is that an example of uh, what, what you talked about with it? I'm not sure if that has so much to do with philosophy, but it does illustrate what we were discussing about how much is possible and how much power has theoretically become democratized. But uh, there are a few instances where we really see that manifest. I think that is one instance of a time when it really did. Yeah, I was thinking more along the lines of how certain institutions in chaotic times, they sort of move to protect themselves, mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense. So in, in that instance, obviously, the big banks and, say, you know, Wall Street, amongst others, it was a pretty precarious time and, and straight away that they kind of move to protect their own interests. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I see what you're saying now, and I think you're... You're entirely right. If we look about, if if we look at this situation, nothing was contributed to society. Nothing was invented. No value was uh, contributed to anyone's economy. What did happen was wealth changed hands. People fought for wealth. People fought for wealth that had already that uh, already existed, right? Um, and Right. People were like the second there was violence, people moved to protect their own in, uh, interests because that's what a lot of making money looks like now. It's protecting money. It's not actually creating value. Right. And I think there is too much of that right now. Too many people right now are are rich from what we would call rent seeking, which is collecting without contributing uh, and too few people are rich by contributing to uh, Smith's notion of real wealth. So yeah, money changed hands and it was violent and everyone uh, said, like rapidly moved to cover your own ass. Um, and it's unfortunate that that's how people get rich now because people should get rich from making things, from saving lives, from making people's lives better. So at least we know that people have the power to do that. And I hope they do good things with that instead of, you know, just, just fighting for stuff that, that people already, already have, which is not to say like, I'm not necessarily even casting judgment on anyone involved in this uh, Reddit stock weird incident. Um, I just, it makes sense now to people to get rich by taking money from others and it is much better, if not more easy, to invent value. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, who have been some of the most influential philosophical, uh, sorry, who have been some of the most f um, deeply impactful philosophers or practical philosophy lessons, philosophical lessons that you've learned, which have really kind of resonated with you, if you could just share a few. Sure. Um, I would say that the most important philosophy uh, to getting out of whatever conundrums we're in at the moment would be uh, probably sci uh, philosophy that was defining the scientific enlightenment. So I think the work of Francis Bacon, 
this was long before the scientific enlightenment, but perhaps Socrates and his defense of dialectic and search for truth and logic and uh, Plato's defense of why being a good person often meant being the most logical person and the, to some extent that even made you the most human you could be. I think these are all things we really need to remember because we can't find what is right without searching for what is truly right and that is searching for truth and that requires reason and science and dialectic. I love it. I love it, man. This has been an absolute pleasure. I've just got two staple questions before we ask you to sign off and tell these guys we didn't connect with you. What books have been the most influential in your life that you've read? Recently, actually, Brian Keating recommended to me uh, Leonard Susskind's series called The Theoretical Minimum. And I have been going through those and loving them without going too deep into uh, symbolic and technical uh, aspects of physics. It really gives you the picture of everything that we know about the physical world. And it gives that picture beautifully and minimally. And it tells you the story of something which is usually like, you, you don't normally get the story of any of this until after you already spend time in the field. And in terms of hacks, which are available to anyone, I think starting with something that gives you the story and then working backwards from that is sort of a hack that is possible now uh, through books like these that isn't typically uh, as possible. And uh, I mean, there have been other uh, great books I've read. I mentioned the, the Double Helix by Jim Watson and sort of gives you a sense of what great science looks like so that uh, whatever you try to accomplish can be uh, through some means of, of getting there that's been uh, already found and, and invented. I think that was a really great book and one which I, I loved. So yeah, I think those have been also just in terms of how I know some of the, the things that um, maybe we touched on a little bit, although like not much in this conversation. Uh, I talk sometimes about philosophy, a history of Western philosophy by Bertrand Russell is a very comprehensive book that goes into a lot of depth, not full depth, obviously, it's a, it's a summary, but it sort of tells you everything about a discipline. Um, and what a wonderful, what a wonderful read. Yeah, it is a great book. And my last question for you today, before I ask you to sign off, is what makes a life worth living? <laughs> I could, I could spend a lot of time on this. I'll try not to spend too much. Um, there are sort of two uh, ways which we can experience meaning. There is what can be experienced as meaning, which may not be objectively meaningful. So humans are a case selective species. We are designed to start families and love our families and fall in love and all of these things feel meaningful to us. Essentially, they're programs that we run because evolution found this a convenient means of ensuring reproduction. Uh, it's how we survive, it's how we mate. Um, the origin of what we experience uh, as humanly meaning is not particularly beautiful, but it can be experienced as beauty and that's that's a wonderful that's a wonderful thing to feel even if you know that objectively it's meaningless you can enjoy it because you know that it is meant to be experienced as meaning i think there is also meaning which is um objective and has very little to do with the human experience so we use science to determine what uh, the universe is really about, how the universe works, uh, what ultimate truth is that has nothing to do with humanity and everything to do with what this place actually is. And I think to many scientists, 
that's almost equivalent to seeing some aspect of God, right? Because uh, that is the thing which uh, makes all of the decisions about what exists and how it exists. And we are blessed with the consciousness to be able to understand uh, the profound truth and beauty of the universe. And that is another thing which can be experienced meaningfully, which is actually meaningful. So I think to live a uh, fulfilled and meaningful life is both to indulge in what we perceive as meaning with unromantic origins, it's programs that we're running in our own brain. Uh, I think you have to experience some amount of that. You have to connect to the world around you. You have to connect to earth. And I think for some of us, uh, you know, I think Macbeth laments about this. Um, life doesn't feel meaningful uh, if, it is, if it is just that. And the solution to that is very often to connect with what is ultimately true and beautiful and the condition of the universe. Man, that was a beautiful answer. That was a beautiful answer. Where can these guys connect with you, Zev? Um, actually, can we pause for one minute? I, I don't even know what my own. Uh, oh, I've, I've got them up by you. I think it's at Zev underscore Weinstein on Twitter and Generation Z on YouTube. Okay. So should I say that? or Yeah, should... yeah I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. Man, where can these guys connect with you, Zev? Um, I am at Zev underscore Weinstein on Twitter. I'm Generation Z on YouTube. Uh, and I will try to share what goes on inside my head with uh, the world around me through these platforms and however possible. Man, this was an absolute pleasure for me. I've been looking forward to this all week. You know, I look at people like you and um, you fill me with hope that the world is going in a good direction. You know, so I just want to say, Really thank you for coming on the show, for taking the time. Um, it was a real, real pleasure for me. I learned a lot, and I'm just looking forward to getting this out there, man. It was a real pleasure. Yeah, I appreciate that, Joe. The fact that these conversations are still possible sort of undermines some of my cynicism, and I'm very happy that that's the case.